thank you, Colin. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And the, the idea is to uh, give you a, an overview of what we've been doing, what we are doing, and what we plan to do in the field of, of pneumonia, and understand that, that some of the objective is to, for you to, to get to know what we do in Louisville, for us to get to know what you're doing here and see if we can proceed with future collaborations. Um, when I discuss, uh, when we look at, at pneumonia, one possibility is to say that there is a pathogenesis of pneumonia with a tr uh, regular uh, triangle in infectious diseases, the host, the pathogen, the treatment. And then uh, in patients or in animals, we look at clinical outcomes. The patient may uh, be cured, failure, or death. Uh, and, and the interconnection between what happened in the lung and what happened clinically, we want to believe is the, the systemic, the lung and systemic inflammatory response. All these uh, um, and this uh, systemic lung and systemic inflammatory response can give us either lung repair, lung injury, and this type of uh, outcomes. <clears throat> when we discuss uh, research, um, I'm going to be touching in each one of these things uh, that we've been doing. Uh, initially, what are our <clears throat> primary research projects at this moment? Um, in 1999, we created what we call the COVID acquired pneumonia organization. This is a, a network of, uh, at this moment, uh, we have 35 countries, <coughs> 122 uh, universities. Uh, this is a large database. Uh, the um, University of Louisville, we have our, our uh, support unit there for this uh, organization. This is an ongoing organization. We enter cases and we evaluate how pneumonia is managed in different uh, countries. Um, this is called, the, again, CAPO, and we have a website, and usually when I travel international, I'm always recruiting new investigators for, for our uh, uh, network. <clears throat> uh, then we want to evaluate the current management and foster really global research in the field of pneumonia and influenza. These are clinical uh, investigators. I was telling Colleen, now we have our annual research meeting following the American Thoracic Society. We spend one day everybody just telling what are you doing in research, what are your ideas. It's a, it's a research meeting. It's a little different in the sense that, that people have 15 minutes to tell me what are you thinking today, what you plan to do in the future. But what you've done two years ago, you already published, I already know. But we want to know essentially inter, this type of interactions. Um, <clears throat> we work on, on ventilators in pneumonia with another network in the United States. Um, we usually do uh, data collection, uh, data analysis through, through internet-based uh, uh, databases. This is a study that uh, we work with uh, Colleen, uh, severe influenza pneumonia surveillance. This was a Homeland Security. Uh, the, the whole idea of this uh, study, we look at, at, it, at through the state of Kentucky, different intensive care units and what happened with influenza in patients with severe pneumonia. Um, the idea was to develop a, a surveillance detection for a novel influenza virus strains uh, in Kentucky. Um, I, I remember that the introduction of this grant was that if it's going to be an avian influenza that emerged in the United States, it will not happen in New York City or San Francisco. Because you need to be in a rural area with birds, get in contact with pigs, get in contact with humans, and this is going to be in rural America. And we think that rural Kentucky is, would be a perfect place to have a new avian flu. Then by the time that now you go to any local area, a young person arrived to the hospital, die, we don't know what, and a lot of people can die we, before we figure out that someone arrived to a city with an intensive care unit. And then this was the idea of the plan, and we need to have this surveillance in the areas where these new viruses can uh, emerge. Uh, this was the... the um, and a study of Oseltamivir, uh, randomized clinical trial sponsored by the CDC. We finished this last year, um, looking at if you were admitted to a hospital with pneumonia, what happened if I give you Oseltamivir immediately, you have uh, influenza. Uh, when I travel international, I usually have to show the United States where is Kentucky. Um, in this, uh, um, and then in Kentucky, where is Jefferson County, where is Louisville, Louisville, Jefferson County, because this is where we are doing our population-based studies. Um, and, and one thing that, that we are doing is uh, for several years, we have a, a, a network of the nine adult hospitals in Louisville or Jefferson County. Then we are able to look at uh, pneumonia, influenza in the full county, if you are hospitalized. Then at this moment, you 
pass by Louisville, you get pneumonia, you go into one of these night hospitals, and you're going to be in one of our studies. Because you're always going to be an study coordinator asking, do you want to participate in research? Then this is our network of hospitals, uh, and this is what we use for this CDC uh, study. Um, as I mentioned, the clinical outcome of hospitals, especially with influenza. We are doing, an, uh, there's another group, this, um, the group that we're looking at, at cytokines in patients with, uh, with uh, pneumonia. Uh, and, and then, uh, most recently, this is, uh, the acronym is Hospitalized Adult Patients with Pneumococcal Pneumonia Incidence Study. And we call it the HAPPY Study. We're looking at, again, for two years, we're going to be looking at all hospital spaces with pneumonia. This is a, an investigation initiated proposal, but we're working with funding from Pfizer. And Pfizer Pharmaceutical just developed a, a kit that is not commercially available yet, that in the urine, they can detect not only if you have pneumococcus, but what serotypes of pneumococcus, because this is important for vaccine development. Then we are doing what are the most common serotypes for pneumococcus in, uh, in Jefferson County. Um, again, clinical economic burden of pneumococcal pneumonia. When we are <clears throat> looking at, this is Jefferson County, this is the United States, when we try to extrapolate on incidence data, it's important, for instance, males, 48%, uh, 49% of the United States, more than elderly, 13%, 13%, uh, uh, poverty level, 15%. I don't want to say that the population is equal, but it's very, very similar to the population of the United States. Then whenever we learn about everybody in Jefferson County, we can extrapolate probably to the U.S. Then <clears throat> we are just applying to a CDC grant, that really the deadline is March 3rd, uh, that they want to look at vaccine effectiveness, and they also want to see the incidence of influenza requiring hospitalization in the United States. Well, we're going to define incidence of influenza requiring hospitalization in Jefferson County, and then the formula is simple to extrapolate to the United States. And then uh, probably this is what they're looking at. They're looking at and places that you can do population-based studies that you can then extrapolate to the, uh, to the, to the U.S. Uh, this is a, a recent NIH study looking at HIV-associated lung disease. Um, this is the collaboration there at the different universities. And here we are looking at the level of oxidative stress in, uh, and pulmonary function in patients with HIV. And then, uh, of course, at the university, uh, Colleen was uh, still part of the, the, the Center for uh, Predictive Medicine, uh, and, and we, do it, we do a lot of collaboration with the center. Um, and this is essentially a brief summary of what we're doing in, in research. Then, how do we, what information do we have <clears throat> in these different areas? Uh, pneumonia uh, pathogenesis. Again, I, I'm giving a brief overview of the different aspects. <clears throat> we say pneumonia pathogenesis. Well, we know that uh, if we assume that this is the alveolar, the alveolar macrophage, the capillary in the lung of an animal, of a human, and this is a pneumococcus that is getting into the lung, we know that the pneumococcus multiply, the, the alveolar macrophage is going to produce uh, cytokines. These cytokines goes into the systemic circulation. These generate, I mean, they are pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, anti-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, locally, uh, and this is going to generate the, the local inflammatory response. There is uh, neutrophils, but really there is lymphocytes, there is fluid, there are proteins, and then we end up with all this in the alveola, uh, and this, the, the, this is the consolidation phase of pneumonia. Um, <clears throat> the patient arrived to the clinic, to the emergency room, with this type of uh, pathophysiology. As clinicians, we learned that, they, okay, this is a local inflammatory response, and this is a systemic inflammatory response. How this is going to translate clinically? Uh, well, uh, the local inflammatory response, the patient is going to have cough, sputum production, tachypnea, hypoxemia, the pulmonary infiltrate. <clears throat> and the systemic inflammatory response gives us the fever, leukocytosis, elevated c reactive protein, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, procalcitonin, and all the mediators. Yes? Yeah, this is a good, uh, it's a good point. Usually, by the time that a patient is symptomatic, you are going to see both. Um, uh, but by the time that a patient arrives, but, but essentially, yes, it's going to be first a local, and then it's going to move uh, systemic. By the time that a patient arrives, then this is, 
uh, because because if you read, if you read a, a clinical textbook, they say the patient with pneumonia has cough, fever, leukocytosis, but to me, we need to bring this into the pathophysiology and to understand that the cough is really the white blood cells that are in the alveola that now you are bringing out. Then this is white blood cells that are coming. Uh, the fever is the interleukin-1 that the alveolar macrophage produce that went to the hypothalamus that give you fever as a systemic response. Then people say, oh, you have pneumonia, give me an x-ray, and no, you have there you know, a pulmonary infiltrate in the x-ray. Well, when you look at the x-ray, what is that you're looking? You're looking at the white blood cells in the lung. But that part could be feedback from the systemic effects of the <clears throat> Exactly, because, because, because as you, exactly, because then, no, the, in, the, in the local production of uh, granulocyte colon stimulating factor, and other cytokines, this is going to go to the bone marrow. The bone marrow is going to produce more white blood cells, and the white blood cells are going to infiltrate the lung. And then finally, you're going to get a positive X-ray. Then the positive X-ray is the local response, but still the systemic is already working. This is a combination. But, but it's a way to understand that there is a local inflammatory response and there is a systemic inflammatory response. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, as, as the pathogenesis of pneumonia. Um, and then clinically, uh, the clinical response, any other, any other comments? I, mean, I, I keep talking, but just please, this is. Um, the clinical response, the patient arrives to the hospital, and then we see that sometimes the severity of disease may decrease. The patient may have early clinical improvement, late, or may have severity of disease, increase, deterioration, Three days we call early, three to seven late, or the person may have a non-responding uh, pneumonia. Then uh, this would be the pathogenesis and the clinical presentation together of the pneumonia patient. Um, <clears throat> we done uh, a lot of things looking at, at the pathogen characteristic into all this. Uh, and, and then looking at the pathogen characteristic, let's go back to the study of collecting these are different influenza cases in different intensive care units through the state of Kentucky. Uh, and then ICU, uh, severe uh, pneumonia. Uh, and these are the different, um, essentially, um, a viral pneumonia in intensive care unit. And now we recognize viral pneumonia is becoming very common uh, in, even in patients with intensive care units. These are different months of the year, and there is always a percentage, 20 25% of viral pneumonia. Um, and, and this is <clears throat> what we published. This, this is, again, the, the SIPS uh, project. From this project, uh, the oropharyngeal swab were in the laboratory, and then Colleen was getting the swab and was putting it into eggs and coming with the viruses. And then we have really uh, to work in the laboratory the real viruses from the patients. But this is another thing that is, is very uh, interesting to us as clinicians that, that when people work with influenza viruses in most places, they're working with two viruses that are always the same from two patients in California for 20 years ago that were two ambulatory cases. That it has nothing to do really with real life. Then this idea of translation that you go from the clinic to the laboratory, one thing is we need to get the real organisms. Um, then virus isolation, and then um, uh, Colleen was looking at the, at the virulence, uh, again, the, the pathogen itself. Uh, are different, in, when we get influenza, uh, we always say, well, if you have a bad influenza, is the host response, the inflammatory response. But it could be that you have a bad virus, that this virus is more aggressive than another one. Um, then uh, probably Colin should uh, mention this, but the, the body weight, and it was clear here that, that this virus here was more virulent, at least in the animal, than these ones. And then you ended with a, with a Kentucky 136, Kentucky 180. That's high virulence, low virulence. Uh, I remember that that's when, um, when you show us the lung of an animal that is not infected, a lung with an animal that is infected with a low virulence with 0% mortality and this 100% and this is the lung. This is very simple for us as clinicians. This lung looks very bad. <laughs> this lung is a lot of bleeding and this virus is bad and there's a lot of mortality. Um, then this is a little more sophisticated, but again, uh, um, uh, this is a bronchial, this is the, the number of viruses in the 
in the bronchial viola lavage, in the lung compartment, not bronchial viola lavage. And you see this is the Kentucky 180, this is the less virulent virus. Then this, um, and there's a lot of data in this uh, uh, publication for the different virulence, but these are patients, real patients from uh, Kentucky. Then this is different virulence for influenza. And this applies probably to all pathogens that we recognize. It's not just pneumococcus, it's MRSA, it's also what is the virulence of a particular uh, organism. Uh, for streptococcal pneumonia, there's a lot of virulence factors. Um, we know that in the capsule, this is the polysaccharide. Uh, the, the polysaccharide gives us the different uh, serotypes. Uh, and, and looking at, at, at all the patients that were from different areas, we look at serotypes in bacteremic uh, pneumococcal pneumonia to see if there was any difference between serotypes and, and severity. Uh, the most common serotypes that we find uh, international, these are the most common serotypes, um, the number of isolate. Most of these serotypes are in the two vaccines that we have currently in clinical practice. Um, going back to our um, structure of clinical response, uh, we found that a clinical failure occurring for 2% of the patient with bacteremic pneumococcal pneumonia, and then we wanted to see uh, clinical failure uh, looking at in hospital mortality, if the patient developed bacteremia or meningitis, a failure to reach clinical stability or prolonged length of stay. These are different clinical outcomes that we can look at patients. And what happened with the different uh, serotypes? And these are the most common uh, serotypes that we identify. And for instance, serotype 23A is not in any vaccine. Then even though it's not a common serotype, appears in every, is the only serotype that is in every type of poor outcome is always there. Then this brings us to the idea, well, we need to probably be looking at this 23A a little more because as new vaccines are developed, we need to develop new, we need to add new serotypes to the vaccine. What do we add? The most common serotype or the most aggressive serotype? 23A may not be very common, but it may be, as, may be the, the big problem for, for humans. Another way to look at, at virulence of organism. This patient was admitted to the hospital, has an upper lobe infiltrate, looks like a cavity there. A young a female in the CT scan, there was clearly a big cavity, uh, and, and then looking at, at day one, you have a cavity, day two, even the extra, you see the, how the lung is disappearing every day. Um, this was severe necrotizing pneumonia. This patient died after one week in the hospital due to uh, an special uh, medicine resistant staph aureus, that is the, the USA 300, a very aggressive form of pneumonia, that if you have this form of pneumonia, or you have influenza with this form of pneumonia, mortality is very high. Again, another pathogen that is very uh, virulent. Um, then the, uh, probably the pantovalentin leucosidine of the MRSA will produce lung uh, necrosis. Uh, and this is another patient with multiple septic emboli, uh, also with um, MRSA USA 300, PVL positive, uh, and the, in this case, the pneumonia is hematogenous pneumonia. Most of the pneumonia is aspiration from the oropharynx, but in this case, the pneumonia arrived from the blood. Um, these are all the MRSAs at the University of Louisville Hospital in a Paul electrophoresis to see uh, uh, what are uh, pantovalentin leucosidine uh, positive uh, MRSAs, um, and these are the USA 300. These are patients with pneumonia in the hospital. Uh, patients with ventilator cell pneumonia. This is not community acquired pneumonia. This is, you are admitted to the hospital intensive care unit, you are ventilated, and one week, two weeks later, you develop pneumonia, and this was the MRSA. Then we say, aha, now we have this very aggressive MRSA in the hospital. Uh, these patients are going to do very poorly, because we know that you have this back from the community, you are doing poorly. And we are going to see a big difference, and this is going to be a big splash that we're going to make in the literature. Then uh, we look at is this pneumonia, uh, this patient coming colonized from the community produce early onset pneumonia, but we were also interested in the clinical outcomes. When we look at early onset pneumonia versus late onset pneumonia, uh, there, was, uh, there was no uh, difference. Uh, then this means that this uh, organism we published here is really was living, is living in the hospital setting. It's already there waiting uh, for us. Uh, when we look at uh, um, the PBL negative and PBL positive, looking at clinical outcomes, and they want to say, okay, you are PBL positive, you're going to do poorly, because this is a bad bacteria. 
is a bad pathogen. But again, in this article in clinical infectious diseases, we find out that there was no difference. Then the, the, the explanation in our discussion here is that probably you have these very aggressive organisms in the community. They have all these toxic elements to get a 25-year-old healthy and just kill you. But the same bacteria now is in the hospital, and they don't need to produce all these toxins. They have the same genes, but probably it's not producing all these toxins because to infect an elderly person immunocompromised in the hospital, you don't need to make any effort and then they are not causing bad pneumonia. Then we have the, here the complication of the same bacteria with all the genes, with all the possibility to be very aggressive, but all of a sudden goes to an environment that doesn't need to be too aggressive, and the gene is there, but they are not expressing the gene because we couldn't find any patient with any hole in the lung. They were behaving like a regular pneumonia, not a necrotizing pneumonia. And the patient were not doing poorly compared with other MRSA. That is another thing that the pathogens can, according with the environment, they can be more or less uh, aggressive, uh, not according with the host that they need to infect. Um, moving along, there are a lot of things regarding the, the host that we can uh, discuss, again, going back to uh, CAPO, for instance. The outcomes in females, we notice in every form of outcome, they're always worse than in males. Uh, and this is there's a lot of things now in infectious disease or difference between the sexes on outcomes and, and risk for infection. Uh, then this is at least what we identify in our uh, studies. Um, in the case of the, we have a, a lot of possibility to look at all patients that have received pneumococcal vaccine before they were admitted to the hospital. We have some data on vaccine effective, how well the pneumococcal vaccine prevent hospitalization. Uh, but really, uh, and these are the, the number of patients that have vaccination before admitted to the hospital. Then we have patients with vaccine, patients without vaccine. Then you can do a study to define vaccine uh, effectiveness. Uh, in this study, the overall population has more or less 30% protection. The male is really not significant. It's mostly the females that bring the protection. And this brings the point that females has better response to vaccines than males. Uh, then uh, we published uh, this, and, and, and really, Sabra uh, Klein is, is this was Colleen that invited her from John Hopkins to come to Louisville. We attended the seminar, and after the seminar, we have a discussion, and she was, she's big into vaccine and, and sex differences, and they would say, we have our database, but we never look at this. And then we start looking at this, uh, and there it is, was in our database. And again, another thing that you can have a big database, but you don't know where to look, it doesn't matter. You have a big database. <laughs> Uh, and this is why this interaction is so important. Then uh, we're working with her now in another study of influenza vaccine. That seems to be the same happen. Then uh, females, the immune system of females responds better to vaccines, to foreign antigen. Whenever there is a foreign antigen, seems to be that the females have a better immune response. Uh, and this is why in, in vaccines, but this has never been looked before. The, the res then we have a pneumococcal vaccine with 30% efficacy. But really, the efficacy is almost 70% in females and almost nothing in males. That the 30% efficacy is mostly driven by the good efficacy of the female population. Yes. 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 Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, these are, these are, yeah, these are patients. The, the problem with all these uh, uh, studies of vaccine efficacy, that these are all retrospective studies, is that the, all the vaccine history is based on what the patients tell you. And, and, and we recognize today that what the patients tell you is extremely bad. Okay? But, you know, it's one of these things that is the best that we can have now. It's, it's, excuse me? No, 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 because, um, because essentially, I, I always put my own example. If you ask me, you received the pneumococcal vaccine, I tell you, yes. You ask me when, I don't know. I just, it's, this is, I've been, I'm always joking, I'm making rounds. Oh, yes, yeah, this article, yes, yeah, go to a New England Journal of Medicine one or two years ago. Then the resident came to Dr. Ramirez 10 years ago. <laughs> I say, well, I don't know, I lost track of time, <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> and then you want a patient that is sick to remember when the vaccine, what vaccine is, is the recollection is very poor. 
This is why in the, in the CDC grant that we are submitting now for vaccine efficacy, they say that if you are going to do vaccine efficacy based on patient recollection, the answer is you don't get the grant. You have to give me something else. And then we come out with a new system that, that we're going to go to the, the doctor's medical record. We're going to go to the insurance, trying to see who paid for the vaccine, when they paid. I mean, you need to get some objective evidence if you really want to publish a, a good paper on vaccine effectiveness. Because, of course, you do a clinical trial and you give vaccine, not give, then you have the data, but these clinical trials usually is only for approval of the vaccine. After this, everything is retrospective studies. But, the, but, but then we are developing a group in Louisville that is going to be just concentrated in getting objective information on vaccine effectiveness or, or, or the, on the vaccine history. Because now, they, as you know, now there's more than five different uh, influenza vaccines that are approved in the market. Then you want to do a vaccine effective. It's not only you receive the vaccine, when you receive the vaccine, what vaccine? Is the high dose, the regular dose, the, the live attenuated vaccine, the nasal, the intradermal, the IM, the intramuscular? Then you want to do all this data needs to be there. How is the patient going to remember this? Oh no no this is this is uh, this is no this is why I say that all all this data on 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 observational studies based on patient recollection here what we have is you receive the vaccine yes or no uh, but still it's all patient uh, all this again is is just the, the the interesting point that this trend okay yeah this is another post consideration. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, then there are the two vaccines. Treatment. We can discuss a lot about uh, uh, treatment <clears throat> in this, because of course the treatment is going to kill the pathogen, it's going to alter the pathogenesis. And, uh, and I put treatment here, this is of course after the patient is already seen, or after the animal, you give something for treatment. This is why you need to give some period that the the disease is supposed to progress. In humans, in pneumonia, usually it's three to five days until you get to the hospital, you get to the clinic. Then we have three to five days, that is just the host and the pathogen, then you are sick enough to go and then we add the treatment. Um, and going back to our um, uh, capo, we have uh, atypical pathogens in pneumonia, are mycoplasma, chlamydia, legionella, so they're considered atypical uh, pathogens. And the incidence is similar around the globe. We have, this, we have data from, from different countries. Um, and then uh, we published in the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine, this, uh, we combine the, our biorepository with atypical pathogens from different countries and the treatment. And we notice that if you treat for this atypical pathogen, there is definitely a difference in outcome. And now this is part of the guidelines. We need to cover this pathogen. It's difficult to find this pathogen because you need a special test. But if you don't treat, then the person is going to have worse outcomes. There are different uh, uh, pathways have to treat uh, patients. And, and even in elderly patients, for instance, we found that you follow the national guidelines, you follow the appropriate treatment, then you get better outcome. No question that, that I mean, simplistic there. You use the wrong treatment, the patient is going to die. You use the optimal treatment, better chance of the patient to get better. Uh, on the other hand, we, in, in our studies of ventilator cell pneumonia, because in clinical practice, there's a lot of discussion of clinical guidelines. Clinical guidelines is you accumulate all the evidence, okay, we are supposed to do A, B, C. And guidelines are good because simplify things. On the other hand, it was always mentioned that uh, not every patient read the guidelines. Then you need to, there's always an art of medicine. You cannot do, you no know, cook medicine for everybody. In this study, um, this is a lot of analysis of patients with ventilator or pneumonia. But the summary of this study, we implement guidelines uh, for multiral resistant pneumonia and intensive care unit. Uh, and, and, the, uh, and what we find out is that essentially you follow the guidelines from the national guidelines, the patients were doing worse. 
And then say, well, this is a negative study because our hypothesis is going to be you follow the guidelines, you're a good boy, the patient is going to do better. But this was worse. But it was interesting because in Lancet, this was published, and the first center of the discussion in our cohort study compliance with ATS, IDSA guidelines was associated with increased mortality. Then, um, again, the guidelines are there, but these are just guidelines. It's not to follow in every patient. You need to apply uh, clinical judgment. Um, a lot of things with vancomycin that we've been working on and MRSA, uh, we noticed that as the MIC of vancomycin increased, the outcomes of patient mortality uh, increased. Uh, and this was another study of uh, a new antibiotic, uh, what, an antibiotic, lanesolid versus vancomycin. And we noticed that in patients with <coughs> MRSA pneumonia, um, <coughs> Apache score is a way to say severity of disease increased. And vancomycin, compared with lanesolid, you always get better response with lanesolid. And then this was recently uh, published as a, no, this is one antibiotic versus the other. Uh, and, uh, and antibiotic trials, they get always, the antibiotic get approved by the FDA. And then if you work in a company, you try to develop the best study possible for your antibiotic to work. Then you want the best patient, the best, uh, then you prove the antibiotic work, the antibiotic get approved. And then we have to deal with real life that these are sick patients. It's similar with the vaccines. You do a vaccine study, and you don't want in your study any person that is immunocompromised, has HIV, has cancer, because this patient may fail the vaccine. Then you do your vaccine in all healthy individuals. Then the vaccine is approved, and now we want to use it in all the immunocompromised patients, <laughs> and there's no data. This is why these data, this is the best data that we have. They get well, well the, the, the FDA approved the vaccine, excluding these categories. But once the vaccine is approved, as clinicians, you're going to use the vaccine in all the categories that have been not studied. No, but the, 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 FDA, the FDA said this vaccine is not approved for immunocompromised individuals. No, 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 but, but let me... Let me uh, 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 there are two things with the FDA, and this is important when we discuss uh, issues. If you have a study that this antibiotic, this vaccine, this antiviral doesn't work, then it doesn't get FDA approved. But it's not approved because the drug doesn't work. Now, you do a study of, as we have now, the, the challenge with oseltamivir, Tamiflu for influenza has been approved in healthy individuals going to the clinic that you give oseltamivir and you decrease one day of fever. One day. This is the approval. Now, as physicians, we want to use it in the hospitalized patient with severe influenza. Has never been a study. It's not approved. But no, no, no. There's, there's, there's zero prospective randomized studies. There's a lot of studies of the one that we are doing, retrospective, looking back. Then essentially, the FDA, you don't have an approval for oseltamivir in hospital patients with influenza from the FDA. You have an approval for ambulatory patients. But then in real life, you have to use it. Then what do you do to evaluate this? You go to databases, you figure out, you publish in 1,000 patients hospitalized, we look at this, and then you have all the bias and all the confounders. And all the, but in real life, you have to use the drug. Then... Vaccines are not approved in immunocompromised patients because they are not a study. This means that my HIV patients are going to go without vaccines. No, I'm going to vaccinate all my patients. But where is the data? Retrospective observational studies with all the problems. Um, then this is the point is that, that one thing gets approved, but then we want to use it for other indications. And this is why we use 90% of the medication. We use it for things that are not FDA approved. There are a lot of infectious diseases, for instance, a bone infection, osteomyelitis. We all have a friend of osteomyelitis. Well, there is not a single antibiotic that has been studied for osteomyelitis. This means that tomorrow you have osteomyelitis, I'm not going to give you an antibiotic. Yes, I give you an antibiotic, based on my experience and these retrospective studies. Um, then, going back, to, going back to the idea is that, that, that and this is why, there's a lot of, uh, from animal studies to clinical studies that we have to do, even for drugs that are already approved. 
These are going to be phase four studies. Uh, going back to, well, we're on the topic, rapid empiric trimer of seltamivir study. <coughs> As a matter of fact, uh, five years ago, the CDC said there is no data on hospitalized patients. Prospective randomized. They get a request for application for one prospective randomized clinical trial in the United States to look at Tamiflu in patients hospitalized. We um, were awarded this trial. We did it for four years. In theory, this is going to be our New England Journal of Medicine uh, publication. Well, as you remember, two years ago, there was a season there was no influenza. There was zero influenza. There was no influenza in Kentucky. We have 5% of the patients. Then they say, this is the problem when you do influenza trials. Because now we are going to do, probably, we hope to be funded for five years. Uh, vaccine effectiveness. Well, how much influenza is going to be next winter? We don't know. We may have a lot of patients. Or we may have an excellent vaccine. And we may have almost no patient. Then sample size, population is totally, with influenza, the only thing that we know is that you cannot predict anything. Everything is unpredictable. Then uh, in this study, we ended with uh, a minimal number of patients. Uh, but this is, um, this is um, some uh, data on, you see, these are patients with uh, no oseltamavir and patients with oseltamavir. You can clearly see, you don't need a statistical analysis to see that there is no difference. When we randomize the patient, these are all patients with influenza. You get admitted to the hospital, we give you oseltamavir. There was no difference in mortality, in length of stay, in clinical stay. There was no difference in anything. Well, uh, it's funny because this data is at this moment at the CDC. Uh, but the CDC keep telling us, well, we don't have data, but at this moment, let's use oseltamavir just in case. Well, um, excuse me? Yes, Roche has, uh, no. Yeah, yeah, with healthy patients, yes. But uh, this is, there's a lot of controversy at this moment. Uh, there are meta-analyses. There are a lot of people say that Roche is making a lot of money for something that is not working. Uh, but some people say, I look at my 200 patients at work. Other people say, this is always looking back. Um, the, the probably the explanation here, this patient as we mentioned, you have probably five days or four days of flu before you arrive to the hospital. Probably these drugs are already too late to work. Um, <clears throat> but this is the data that we have, <clears throat> that, that essentially oseltamivir is not helping once you are hospitalized. You look at the last month, the CDC keeps saying, keep using oseltamivir. Um, Let's go to lung and systemic inflammatory response a little. Uh, and, and then we have the, the inflammatory response, uh, local and systemic. <clears throat> the, uh, the traditional approach in the patient has severe pneumonia uh, has been always that there's so much cytokines in the lung, so much high level of pro-inflammatory cytokines, that then they spill to the systemic circulation and then you have a high response here and a high response here. And there's always the idea that what can we do to decrease the cytokine storm of the influenza, the cytokine storm, severe pneumonia, it's always the same storyline. And do we use uh, steroids or do we use um, uh, immunomodulators? Um, then we look at this um, in the last uh, year, looking at blood for um, systemic inflammatory response and looking at sputum, uh, then cytokines in the sputum as a way to look at what happened in the lung. And this is a way to look at the local inflammatory response and the systemic inflammatory response. Um, this is, uh, there are different uh, uh, cytokines. This is Fernandez Botran that's doing this with us. Um, uh, and the systemic inflammatory response, let's look at, let's say, interleukin one. Let us, um, the, the systemic inflammatory response is basically a severe pneumonia, not severe pneumonia. We see what we expected. A lot of cytokines in the systemic, res, uh, in the blood, in the patient with bad pneumonia. Bad pneumonia, a lot of cytokines. Uh, and we, when we look at the cytokines in the lung, this is what we were always taught as, no, growing in medical school, then the lung is also needs to be in fire. The lung is supposed to be high systemic response. Well, in these uh, 20 patients, in severe pneumonia, in the lung, this minimal inflammatory response. Um, then this is just a pilot study. 
But based on this pilot study, we are now, we'll see if we can come out with funding for a large study. But essentially, what we notice is that, at least in the patients, this pilot study, uh, the patient with bad pneumonia, and these are all comers. Some has influenza, some have pneumococcus. This is, the, we don't have enough to do it pathogen specific. If you have a low inflammatory response here and a high inflammatory response in the blood, then uh, it's, it's almost, if we can, no, we have a, a um, we discussed this in, the, in an article, that it's almost like a, the lung is immunocompromised. And then you don't have enough response in the alveolar, then the pneumococcus, the fluid is, is simple to go into the systemic, and it's almost like the systemic circulation is trying to respond to a deficiency in the lung. And this brings the point that then, in the systemic is very high. If I give a steroid, well, yes, it's good for the systemic response, but it's bad for the lung response, because the lung is already immunocompromised. And this, we are bringing a total hypothesis that probably the lack of response that we have in all these trials of let's block the, the cytokine storm, it may be that the cytokine storm is in every place except in the lung, and in the lung we may have a cytokine that is not there that respond. Then um, do we need to do something in hell for the lung to improve the response there? At the same time that we do something systemic to decrease the response there, this is all a uh, hypothesis. Then we develop this hypothesis that severe pneumonia, the host response in the lung is low and the systemic is high. Um, and this is, uh, again, this pilot study we just published, the, we said that this is a contrasted inflammatory response in severe and non-severe pneumonia. Um, We think that, we think that, uh, while we, uh, the literature, there's a lot of articles, again, people have been doing, drawing blood in patients with pneumonia. And drawing blood and cytokines, this part has been almost agreed that if you have a lot of cytokines, if you have increased C-reactive protein, a lot of in, increased interleukin-6, increased interleukin-1, you are bad. Usually, you look at the patient, this patient is doing poorly. On the other hand, if you have pneumonia, but your cytokines in the systemic circulation are low, you usually have a mild pneumonia. Then you are admitted to the hospital, if your cytokines are very high, you're going to end in intensive care unit on a ventilator, but your cytokines, the systemic response is low, usually you're going to go to the ward and you're going to do fine. Then this part is more or less established. The consideration is that we always thought that the systemic response is a correlation of what happened in the lung. High response in the lung moving to high response in the systemic circulation. A low response in the lung moving to a low response in the systemic circulation. Because the problem is that looking at the lung has been always difficult. Because you need to do bronchial viral abash. It's just now that you do cytokines in breath condensate, cytokines in sputum, and then we can start doing this more frequently. Uh, again, this is only a pilot study, and this is a new hypothesis that we would like to try. Now we're submitting an NIH proposal to see if we can try this in a large population. Because if this were to be a new paradigm of systemic response or inflammatory response, not local and systemic, in pneumonia, then the management of this inflammatory response is supposed to be two different compartments. Now, if these compartments agree, that probably may agree in some patients, then a single management may be appropriate. This one. Yeah, as opposed to what you're seeing with severe pneumonia and high systemic response. Like the high highs, they seem like they would be like the same kinds of craziness, I guess you could say, in the same categories. And it seems like if you have the same kind of craziness in the lung, you would have many more problems because of the delta nature of the lung. And, uh, I, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. We are, we are, I completely agree. We put this, uh, this uh, thing here just to because it's something that we can measure and we can go for a grant and say this is going to be high compared to something else. But really, I, I, exactly. But I completely agree that the, the name here should be optimal, yeah. adequate. Should be this is what is supposed to happen. Then, then in, the, in our cartoon of the pathogenesis, 
Essentially, you need enough there to take care of the bacteria in the lung. And the systemic, you're not supposed to have systemic, because the systemic is because the systemic will produce the damage. Yes. No, no, this is uh, the, the Yeah, this is. Well, um, <coughs> we, are, we, are, we, are the, we are essentially, we are writing the grant now. Then we are all aware, <laughs> this is going to be perfect. We are writing this, uh, and in the writing, exactly one of the issues is, is what is high, what is low, wh wh what, what is going to be the name of all this. And, <coughs> and we are because another thing that happens is that when you look at individual patients, then what is a high response? Then essentially what we are looking now is looking at all the values, but looking at probably the value that best cut all this, because we're looking at this probably the 75 percentile of the values of the values that we see in patients with pneumonia for a particular cytokine. They say you are above 75 percentile because we have 40 patients that this is more or less the range that we get for interleukin A in or interleukin six in the systemic circulation. From this range, you are in the 75 percentile, you are there or above, you are have a high response for interleukin versus a low response at this moment. Now, what is appropriate? We don't know this one. Then, because, because in this proposal, what we are trying to say is that probably we need to, based on, on a two by two table that you can see the systemic response, high, low, uh, normal, abnormal, uh, optimal, suboptimal, whatever is going to be the name, two systemic response, two local response, then you get a two by two table, and then the patients can be in four spots. Then we are said that probably there are four phenotypes for patients with pneumonia and the local and systemic response. One phenotype, because if this is, um, if this is, well, we have to do the two by two table, but this is severe pneumonia, and this is high response, then you have here point A, severe high, this is one phenotype. But then the other may be no, uh, this uh, severe, but this is low. Then, you have, then we may have four phenotypes that we need to characterize, and these, four, the, these two combinations, four phenotypes. And then the question is, what are the patients that you, can we characterize this, and what are the patients that are going to benefit for immunomodulatory therapy, either stereosystemic or macrolides or some inhale? Um, but also, if we found that you have a bad pneumonia and you're going to die, you have a lot of systemic inflammatory response. <clears throat> but on the other hand, in the lung, you don't have any response. <clears throat> then probably this patient, we need to do something to bring more white blood cells to the lung, to bring more 
uh, inflammatory response to the lung. And, um, <clears throat> and this is something that, that I think that this hypothesis, as always, probably needs to be tested in animals as we tested in humans. Because in animals, it's going to be um, another consideration to test this. Now, then we have one cytokine, 75 percentile. Then we look at the patients, and we have 20 cytokines. It doesn't mean that in every patient, every cytokine is high. Because some cytokines are high, other are near, others are low. Then we are trying to develop what is going to be our modeling to define, okay, this, looking at all these cytokines and all these numbers <laughs> that you get lost looking at the numbers, okay, what these, all these cytokines are telling me what? That this is high, this is normal? We don't know yet. We are, we are uh, for the first time, looking at a lot of cytokines in, in humans trying to define what is. Then we have this 75 percentile, and then we say that we are having pro-inflammatory cytokines, there are seven. And we are saying these four or more are more than 75 percentile. We are going to say that your pro-inflammatory response is high. Again, all this is up just having coffee and deciding. And we are, we are developing a model to see if we can test. Because it, as you said, this is very simple to say, oh, systemic is high. But then you get into what is the meaning of high? What level? And how many cytokines need to be high to call that your system response is high. Because in some cytokines, you don't have a response, regardless of what happens. Are you going to look at the local lung? Are you going to look at the lung? Well, uh, uh, the, only way to look at, the only way to look at the lung every day in a patient is through a sputum. Because, because essentially, there's no other way to look at the lung every day. Then, um, and we are able to do this now because the f getting cytokines in the sputum is becoming more Establish. Then your point that, that this is, you know, this is a sample coming from the lung, from the area of pneumonia, area without pneumonia. It's a, it's a, it's a local sample. Um, because you say, well, uh, if the pneumonia is here, you're supposed to put a tube, go there, wash, and get sample. But you can do this once in a patient, but even in some patients, not even once. But the sputum allows us to keep going day by day. Then this is the best I want to be able to do. Yes? Um, so the quality is due to, I guess, either chemotherapy or the gene study to show what mortality due to mainly sort of that malignant type condition where that it's more like septic uh, inflammatory or... <coughs> this is, this is, um, no, this is very good. Uh, and we go back to this. Uh, and again, we don't know, but, but, um, but the, but, but the pathogen may uh, play a role. But, but uh, once you are in a hospital setting, I may say that, that once you're in a hospital setting and you, have, you receive treatment, uh, assuming that there is treatment for this pathogen, assuming that, you know, this is pneumococcus, or assuming that there is influenza, I give you a seltamavir, I don't know what's happening, but I, I give you something. Then probably at that point, we want to believe that most of the game is here to see what happened with the patient. By failure, do you mean versus death? Like both of the same thing Well, uh, uh, the, yeah, the idea is that you can, once you are in the hospital, you are in the clinic, you, you can improve um, or you can deteriorate even further while you're in the hospital. And from the ward, you go to the intensive care unit. Okay. And you need to be on a ventilator. And they need to give you cardiac support. And then finally, you didn't die, but you really fail. Yeah. But then you return. And go, but this, you, you don't die, but you are going to be in very bad shape after this episode of hospitalization. Then this clinical failure, uh, you develop a, an acute myocardial infarction because you've been in the intensive care unit. You develop a cerebrovascular accident. Then yes, you survive, but you are in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. Then, then it's... There's a lot of failure without being dead. Right. Um, but it, it, and we want to believe that, that at this moment, of course, all this is important to study this, important to study the pathogen, and it's important to come up with new treatments, <coughs> new antibiotics, antivirals, because there's a lot of these things that were still missing. Now, now people with a new, uh, for influenza, people are talking about combination therapy for influenza, two drugs for influenza. People are trying to come up with something on, if this is 
if the pathogen is influenza and the treatment, we need to get better treatment here. But at the same time, we want to believe that some of this treatment needs to go back here to this area. But the problem is that this area of management has failed and, and has failed study after study, probably because uh, we don't understand very well how is the local and systemic response in pneumonia. Then we go back to the idea that before we do studies, try to modulate the immune response, what about if we do studies, try to understand the immune response? Um, <clears throat> this is, this the, because this immune response is through this and through, of course, the, the lung response, the systemic response, as you mentioned, the lung is very fragile. But then once you have systemic response and capillary leak, then you have cardiac problems, cerebrovascular problems, renal problems. This is what kill most of the patients. Uh, then we want to believe that this has a lot to do. <clears throat> um, and it's probably uh, uh, if your local response doesn't contain the infection and the bacteria or the virus start to spread, uh, then the systemic response is the last resource. Now, the systemic response is bad for the kidney, bad for the brain, but it's better than death. Then it's almost like a, the systemic response is the last resort, and probably makes sense to say, well, if the lung fail, then we have a systemic response at the last resort. <coughs> um, then this is, if we can understand this, probably we can <coughs> look at other ways of treatment, not just the pathogen, but treatment at this level. This is the whole idea. Uh, uh, and then I have a lot of data on, <clears throat> on this, that this is all clinical data, but I want to stop here. Uh, and <laughs> I want to stop uh, uh, because we have a lot of uh, studies. <clears throat> One thing that, that we have, <clears throat> going back to our nine hospitals and our uh, data, we, we have data, we started to accumulate data, clinical data <clears throat> in all uh, patients. And, <clears throat> and then, um, probably I just want to show uh, one thing um, that, um, that this is something that, that we can, uh, uh, for instance, uh, this is some data. <coughs> this, for instance, then this is Jefferson County. Every dot is a case of influenza in Jefferson County. And this is toxic release areas. This is, uh, this is one group. This is then is, is the geomap. Uh, this is the area of rubber town that is a lot of fabrics and toxins. And we have then, again, this is not too much associated, but you can see some associated. Then, then we have the full population. We have the address. We have the dot. And we can, and then in the full population, you have the census data. And we can start playing with census data, cases. And we are going to have all this data for all lower respiratory tract infection. We hope if we get this grant, for the next five years. Then, for instance, another way to look at this, a poverty level and admissions to the hospital. And of course, this is East End on Louisville, where the most uh, poverty level. And you can see, no, this is, um, yes, this is the East part. Uh, uh, but, but the point is that, that whatever is in the census, you can go to a census track, and you can look at age, we can look at a lot of things, and we can translate this into population, and, and we are moving now more into, into this geomapping and, and evaluating uh, socioeconomic and social factors with pneumonia. This influenza, but we're going to have data for all pneumonia. Then this is <coughs> a lot of modeling here for, for influenza and pneumonia uh, moving forward, because we are going to have a lot of data. And then we're thinking, <coughs> okay, this is poverty level in Jefferson County, uh, and these are this is, uh, this is a statistical significance on these circles. Um, and, and don't ask me about this because I'm not doing the geomapping, but, but I like the colors and I like the, the way that this, I can, I can clearly see this as a clinician. But, but, um, but essentially, um, the, to me, the issue is, well, we have this in, 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 in Jefferson County. If we are going to have data on pneumonia in Jefferson County for two consecutive years, every month, every year, can we extrapolate at maps, looking maps of the United States? Okay, this is poverty in Jefferson County, 750,000. What happened with pneumonia in the United States? Can we, can we do mapping of the country based on 
one state. And now we are getting into areas that, that we even lost uh, the capability to, to do this thing because we have a person in the division that works with mapping is very good to do this in Jefferson County and with the census data. They, whatever is in the census, we can figure out the association of this and pneumonia because we are going to have data and this data is going to keep uh, accumulating. I just want to show this as another uh, uh, possibility. Okay, with this, um, it, thank you for the invitation again. Thank you.